Hello again, and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 19, and it is entitled Sliding Block Problems and Linear Momentum. The lesson is in two parts, which are not directly connected, and so we'll take them one at a time. We'll begin with sliding block problems. In the funny papers, sometimes an artist will poke fun at physics, and this example from Foxtrot is no exception. Take a moment to read it. While not wanting to sound too preachy, I will tell you that before you can run, you have to learn to walk. And in physics, learning to walk involves handling simple, straightforward problems and lab activities before muddying the concepts with other complicated issues. When we talk of sliding block problems, we generally mean that friction affects the objects under consideration. Let me enlarge this screen just a little bit. In many cases, the object will experience multiple forces that act at various angles. Sometimes an incline is involved. Oftentimes these problems will be contrived so that you might never see such a complicated real world application. But solving these contrived problems will hone your skills so that when you do run across a complex actual system, then you have tools at your disposal in order to go about figuring out what you need to know. Frequently, you'll be presented with a situation and asked to get a numerical result for some particular quantity. Maybe you'll want to know something about the object's motion, velocity, acceleration, position. Or you might be asked to figure out a numerical value for the coefficient of friction, mu. Maybe you'll be required to figure out how to apply a force, how strong and at what angle, in order to cause a certain thing to happen. Whatever it is you're asked to do, the approach you're going to take to solving a problem is generally going to be this, and I'll list the steps out. First, you want to sketch a good diagram and a free body diagram of the object under consideration. Next, you'll apply Newton's second law of motion. You may have to apply Newton's second law both horizontally and vertically, but in any case, you'll need to apply Newton's second law. And then third, you're going to need to use the equations that result from Newton's second law to piece together a set of mathematical relationships that are going to help you to figure out what it is you're looking for. Along the way, you may have to resolve forces into these horizontal and vertical components, and you might find some non-intuitive relationships among the various variables and the forces involved. There's nothing like seeing this in action, so let's see how to handle this using multiple forces. You're not going to find this example in your textbook. Here's the example. A lawnmower of mass m is pushed with constant velocity along level ground using an applied force fp at an angle theta. Find the effective coefficient of friction mu between the ground and the lawnmower. Wow, what a problem. Let's begin with a diagram. There's the ground. There's my lawnmower. The lawnmower has a mass m and it's moving with constant velocity to the right. And there's some force, which we're calling Fp, P for a pushing force, that's directed along the handle. The question asks us to determine the effective coefficient of friction between the lawnmower and the ground. That's the variable mu that we're looking for. The variables that we know include the foot pushing force, Fp, the angle, theta, and the mass, m. Now frequently you'll get problems in which instead of using numbers, you'll have to use symbols, and that's the case here. We could solve this problem using numbers, but it's more powerful to do it symbolically. When you use particular numbers, you find a particular solution that's valid for those particular conditions. On the other hand, when you solve a problem symbolically, and you can see relationships between variables regardless of what the numbers are. You can always throw numbers into the solution later and see how the different variables affect the system. Symbolically, you solve the problem once, and you've got a general solution. You can put numbers in anytime you want, and you'll get a particular solution. We're told that the lawnmower moves at a constant velocity, and this fact is going to be important in analyzing the problem. When we say that it's moving with constant velocity, we mean that the acceleration is equal to zero. 
preview of coming attractions, when we write Newton's second law, which has the acceleration in it, we can put a zero in anywhere that the symbol A appears. As the lawnmower moves across the ground, there are other forces that are acting on it as well. The earth gravitationally attracts the lawnmower. There's a force that pushes up on the lawnmower from the ground that keeps it from going to the center of the earth. And there's this drag force of friction. We would like to label all of these forces that are acting. And so I'm going to sketch myself a free body diagram. So this dot here is going to represent the center of mass of the lawnmower. There's the pushing force, FP. And you'll notice that I've sketched the arrow that represents FP so that its tail is connected to the dot in the free body diagram instead of its tip pushing on the dot. I find that representing the forces as having the tails connected to the dot makes it easier for me to resolve the forces into components. I like my vectors pulling on the center of gravity rather than pushing. Notice which angle is theta. It's the vertical angle across from the theta where the handle would connect to the dot. So that's one force. Now let's label the other forces. The earth pulls the lawnmower downward. We call that the weight force. The ground pushes the lawnmower upward. We call that the normal force. Now I'm not labeling these vectors necessarily to scale. We're going to find that the normal force actually is going to be bigger than the weight in this particular problem. But nevertheless, I'm just symbolically representing them. And the grass drags against the lawnmower. We call that kinetic friction. FF for the subscript F means friction, and the K stands for kinetic. So now, if we're to analyze this system, we need to break any angled forces into components parallel and perpendicular to the coordinate axis. You remember how we do this. We imagine that the pushing force is a hypotenuse of a right triangle. There's one side of the right triangle that's actually touching the angle theta, we'll call that the x component of the force, Fpx. And there's a component that's not touching the angle, that's not the hypotenuse, and we'll call that Fpy. Now remember my mnemonic, Sokatoa, and we find that the side that's adjacent to the angle theta is related to the cosine of the angle, and the side that's opposite the angle theta is related to the sine of the angle. So we can rewrite Fpx and Fpy in terms of Fp and the angle theta. And now what I'd like to do is to replace the force Fp with its components. So I'm going to sketch another free body diagram that shows only the forces that are in the x direction and in the y direction. Here it is. Now what? Here's my resketched free body diagram. I have the normal force that acts up. I have the x component of the pushing force that's acting horizontally to the right, the vertical component acting down, the weight down, and the frictional force acting to the left. Now what? Now we're going to write Newton's second law of motion. You remember Newton's second law. It says that the acceleration is equal to the net force divided by the mass. And this is two equations. There's a horizontal equation. The acceleration in the x direction is equal to the net force acting in the x direction divided by the mass. And there's a y equation that says the acceleration in the y direction is equal to the net force that's acting in the y direction divided by the mass. Now what am I trying to find in this problem? I'm trying to find the coefficient of friction mu. And where is mu? Mu is buried in this frictional force. Remember, the frictional force is equal to mu times the normal force. So if I could find an expression that involved the known variables for the frictional force, and if I could define an expression involving the known variables for the normal force and take the ratio of those, then I would have the expression I'm looking for for the coefficient of friction. How are we going to get that? We're going to get it through Newton's second law. Here we go. Horizontally, we say that the acceleration in the x direction is equal to the net force in the x direction divided by the mass. Well, let's call it to the right positive, and we'll say Fp times the cosine of theta. Notice that that comes from our free body diagram, minus the frictional force, Ffk. Likewise, in the y direction, 
we can write that the acceleration in the y direction is equal to the net force in the y direction divided by the mass. Well, let's call up positive, so I'll have the normal force minus the weight plus the component of the pushing force acting in the y direction. Boy, that looked complicated. But now what do we know about the motion? We know that the motion is under constant velocity. So the acceleration in the x direction is equal to zero, and the acceleration in the y direction is equal to zero. And if I take the mass and multiply it by zero, I get zero. So the left-hand side of my x equation looks like this. Zero is equal to Fp cosine theta minus the frictional force. And the y equation becomes that zero is equal to Fn minus Fw plus Fp times the sine of theta. Now, what is it we're looking for again? We're looking for mu. And this mu is buried in this expression for the friction. Let me substitute that into the x equation. Now, what about this normal force here? Well, I see it over here, too. Let me solve the y equation for the normal force. And now let me substitute this normal force in to my x equation. And let me move this term over here to the other side so I can get rid of that negative. And now I've almost got it. If you'll permit me to substitute m times g in for the weight, I can write my coefficient of friction, mu k. And now when I solve for mu k, I get an expression that involves everything I know. At the beginning, I was told I know Fp, I know theta, and I know m. And g is a constant, 10 meters per second squared. Mr. Haynes, how in the world would I know how to do something like that? And the answer to that question is, you've just got to practice. You're going to get a lot of problems in which you have the opportunity to solve for different things. The point is that you're going to need to mathematically manipulate the equations that you've got and the relationships that you know, such as the relationship involving the coefficient of friction, and then massage your expression until you get out what you're looking for. Let's solve example 19.1. A block has a mass of four kilograms and is pushed to the right across a level surface with a constant velocity. Force P is acting at theta equals 20 degrees to the horizontal. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the surface is mu k equals 0.5. What is the magnitude of force P? Let's begin with the diagram. Now I'm going to solve this problem symbolically, and then I'll throw in the numbers at the very end. Let's begin with a free body diagram. There's the pushing force. Now I've got the normal force, I've got the weight, and I have the frictional force. You'll see I've written algebraic expressions for the normal force and for the weight. Let's resolve Fp into an x component and into the y component. So I have an Fp in the x direction and an Fp in the y direction. And I'm going to replace Fp with its x and its y components. So a new free body diagram with only horizontal and vertical forces will look like this. And now from that free body diagram, I'm going to write two equations. I'm going to write Newton's second law for the x and Newton's second law for the y. Now notice something. Newton's second law, basically, if there's no acceleration, says that the two horizontal forces have to be balanced. So that means Fp cos theta has got to be equal to mu k times Fn. And the vertical forces have to be balanced. In other words, Fn has got to be equal to the sum of mg plus Fp sine theta. Now let me put my zeros in, and let me multiply the mass in both equations times that zero, and I'll end up with an expression that looks like this. Now what am I looking for? I'm looking for a numerical value for Fp. Now I see an expression for Fp here, and I see an expression for Fp here. What do I know? Well, I know m, and I know mu, and I know that g is equal to 10. Is there a way I can massage these two equations so that I can get Fp on one side and everything else that I know on the other side? Let's work on them a bit. 
Let me solve the right-hand equation for Fn and then substitute that Fn into the left-hand equation. So there's Fn and I'm going to put it into the left-hand equation. And now I've got it. I'm looking for Fp. I see I've got Fp there. What do I know? I know a number for theta. That's 20 degrees. I know a number for mu k. That's 0.5. I know a number for g. That's 10. If I can extract Fp out and get it on one side of this equation, then everything else I'll have numbers for. Let's work on it. Multiply through by mu k. And now let's bring the mu mg term to the left-hand side and factor out the Fp from the remaining terms. If you'll permit me to do a couple of steps of algebra in one. And now divide both sides by the parentheses on the right-hand side. There is my general expression for Fp. Now let's throw in the numbers. Numerically, I know that mu k is 0.5, m is equal to 4, g is 10, theta is 20 degrees. And now put those numbers into your calculator. I get that the pushing force is equal to 26.02 newtons, effectively 26 newtons. So let's review what we did in this example. We began by sketching a diagram of the problem. From that, we sketched a free body diagram. We resolved the forces into horizontal and vertical components. We wrote down Newton's second law for the horizontal forces, and we wrote down Newton's second law for the vertical forces. Then we massaged those resulting expressions until we extracted what we were looking for. It required a lot of algebra, and I made it look easy because I've solved lots of these types of problems before. As you wrestle with these problems, you'll get better at spotting what you need to do. I would discourage you from throwing in numbers early in the problem because the college board exam that you'll take in May is going to require you to solve some problems symbolically. I guarantee you, you'll have at least one free response problem that involves only symbolic manipulation without any numbers at all. That's a skill you need to learn how to develop and there's no easy way around it except to work through many examples. And you'll get lots of practice in this course.